crushing live poker tournaments by using some of my hands that I recently played in a $25,000 buy-in tournament to illustrate some points. I've not streamed in a little bit, so if you all are here, please let me know. I want to make sure that things are functioning. You never know when you come back from a trip. I've been upstate with my family for the last uh, few weeks, but I'm back and ready to do the work. So let's get right to it. Let's go through some $25,000 buy-in hands that I played just the other day in Florida. Right off the bat, we are playing only 100 big blinds deep. It is worth noting that in a lot of the high roller tournaments that take place around main events, they usually are kind of turbo-y, which is fine. I don't care. A lot of people think, oh man, a turbo tournament, that's terrible because they want to sit there and play poker all day. Turns out a lot of people do not actually want to sit there and play poker all day. They want to get in some high value spots, win or lose, and then go home. And that is fine. Now, it is worth noting that quite often your edge in turbo e tournaments cannot be that high if your opponents are all reasonably competent just because there's not a whole lot of time to extract value. So as long as you are cool with that, then you're good to go. All right, in this hand, cutoff raises. This is a good, we'll say GTO, American poker player. He raises it up. We have king five suited in the big blind. This is a spot where calling is definitely the GTO recommended play. You can pull up the poker coaching app to see. This is a very clear call before the flop. You may want to three bet every once in a while, like king six suited or something like that, but it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, in this scenario with this hand, you probably want to call. You're going to find that when you are playing somewhat deeper stacked, most of your bluffs, we we'll call them bluffs from out of position, when uh, you do decide to three bet, are going to be with hands like marginal-ish suited connectors, like 8-6 suited, 9-7 suited, 8-7 suited, etc. Whereas if we were shallower stacked, a lot more of our bluffs would come from like ace-x offsuit and king-x offsuit. So this is a scenario where if I am trying to play anywhere near GTO, it's just a very, very easy call. All right, flop comes, ace, six, two. I check. This is a spot where the opponent should bet pretty frequently and small, but they surprise me by betting big. Hmm, 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 hmm. What does that mean? Well, perhaps my opponent has a decently strong value hand. They want to get value with. Notice if I am three betting hands like ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack, then if I have an ace, it's probably not a very good one. So maybe the opponent's going for just a lot of value in the times that I have an ace or a draw or a pair, right? Like six, five suited or something. They could also just be betting big to try to make me fold everything besides a pair. I'm not sure. The fact that this is probably not the GTO play with many hands right off the bat is always unnerving because either the opponent's trying to maximally exploit me in some way or they don't know the GTO strategy here. I don't know. I don't know. Cool spot. Um, King high flush draw, though, usually likes to call. You don't want to raise in this spot because if you raise and get re-raised, it's terrible. If you raise and get called, they could easily have an ace and I'm in rough shape. This is just an easy call. We'll see what develops. Turn is a queen. I check again. Opponent checks. When it goes check, check on the turn, I now start to think the opponent either has a whole lot of hands like a queen. Maybe they just bet hands like queen jack to try to... Um, bluff me off of all unpaired hands or maybe they have some sort of marginal ish ace i have to presume a hand like ace jack or ace 10 would probably keep betting the turn but who knows stuff to know what's happening here I, I i typically think the opponent either has just like nothing or they have a queen a lot of the time they could have an ace though you call if he bets on the turn most likely unless he blasts it gigantically big you're not really trying to fold out king high flush draw why do we not lead on the flop? You never want to lead on the flop on boards that are good for your opponent's range and bad for my range, and ace-high boards are always good for the opponent's range, the, the initial raiser's range. All right, check, check. Where's the queen of diamonds? We got there. Now, we have a few options. We could bet big to try to get him to call with any ace and any queen. Seems reasonable. We could bet small to try to get him to call with any ace or raise with any queen, in which case I would then re-raise. I would not just call. If I bet the river here for, let's say, 3,000 or 5,000, and he makes it something like 20, I'm definitely jamming to try to get full value from a queen. Or I could check to try to get him to bet with any ace, bet with any queen, and bet with 
all of his garbage. The nice thing about checking is that if he does have a lot of garbage, which I think he quite possibly could, we're going to get him to bluff some portion of the time to try to get me off of a six or a two. But at the same time, he may even check back a hand like ace X if he thinks I'm good and will protect my checking range some portion of the time. So this is a spot where I think I either want to bet quite big like pot or I want to bet really small. I'm sorry, slow down, slow down. So this is where I want to check or bet small. I don't like the big bet because if I bet big, he may actually start folding out some weak aces and it makes it impossible for him to bluff. So I think of the options, I would rather either bet small like 5,000 or I'd like to check. I think either one's fine depending on what I think about my opponent. The big bet is only good if you think your opponent's a bit of a calling station with any ace, maybe even any pair. But most players realize this run out is actually really, really bad for pocket sevens, right? So I was going to call in this scenario. So I think in this spot, I'm either going to check or bet small. I think both plays are reasonable. I check. Opponent checks. It's a bummer. They probably had a hand like sevens. You know, the nice thing about a small bet as well is that if they do have a hand like sevens, they may just decide to hero call. A lot of you are saying you want to bet 13,000 or 9,000. I really do not like the medium sizes at all because the medium sizes make it very difficult for the opponent to bluff with whatever bluffs they have. And it also will result in the opponent folding out their really marginal-ish made hands like pocket sevens or pocket jacks, whereas those are hands that I really, really, really want to get called by. Also, it's a situation where you, I mean, you're going to find almost always on the river, something like two-thirds pot is almost never right with a hand like the nuts or the effective nuts. This is the effective nuts here. Um, so this is a situation where you either want to be betting very big or betting small or checking, not betting medium. And you don't want to bet medium with a whole lot of hands anyway in these spots. Usually you're going to be either betting very big with a decently strong polarized range, betting tiny with a thinnish value range, plus a few nuts and a few bluffs, or checking. So check, check. We win the hand. Nothing fancy. All right. King, queen suited. Is there a chance he checks the turn with the set? Absolutely not. I mean, I think that would be pretty bad given I could easily have an ace. All right. We have a limper in the $25,000 buy-in tournament. It is definitely worth noting that in a lot of super high roller tournaments or high roller tournaments, there are a few relatively recreational players. And that is why the games are good. So this is a situation where we can definitely expect this range to be far weaker than normal. Um, this is probably a player who's raising their best hands and limping a lot of their junk. Maybe they limp with some nut hands, but whatever. King, queen, suit is definitely a good enough hand to raise. Cut off three bets. That's annoying. I don't remember who this player is, but we're certainly not folding the king, queen suited. Very, very easy call. 10-4-2. Hijack checks. Um, I think we... I'm sorry, we check, and then they bet 15k. So, they bet small. This is a situation where you cannot fold against good players. I know it may feel a little bit dicey checking and calling with the king, queen, high out of position, but you can't go around folding this. Um, you do want to consider finding some bluffs because if we do have a hand like jacks in this scenario, we probably want to just go ahead and check raise and get in. Maybe a hand like ace 10. So what bluff should we use? Well, first off, do we have a ton of value hands that want to check raise? The answer is not really, right? We don't have a ton of combinations, so we don't really need to have a ton of bluffing combinations. So if we don't want to have a ton of bluffing combinations, we probably want to be bluffing some high equity draws, but notice there aren't actually any of those, and then some low equity draws. And I think a hand like Jack Nine of Diamonds or Queen Nine of Diamonds makes a whole lot of sense to check raise tiny. You may say, could you really check raise to something like 32K and then fold to a shove? And I think you could. I think it's actually not, not insane. Um, that Because whenever you do check raise a hand like Jack Nine of Diamonds, you're obviously going to fold if they shove you, right? And Jack Nine of Diamonds is probably not quite good enough to check and then call, right? So I think in this spot, you want to have an overcard with backdoor flush draw probably to check raise. Small and then fold. Some people saying Queen Jack suited. I think Queen Jack suited might be too good as well. Again, you don't get to find all that many combinations, right? If you're only check raising thin-ish value hands like Jackson Ace Ten, which could be beat anyway, plus um, a few junky bluffs, you, you don't get to have all that many junky bluffs. And if you only are doing with six combinations, it's probably okay. Anyway, this hand I think is probably too good to raise, so we call turns it to a hearts check fold now to any bet fine and standard. Um, 
Also, some people say they would raise small over the limp. When somebody limps for 1,500, you don't want to raise like 5,000 because then you're giving them amazing odds to call with their entire range. And if they're calling with their entire range, you're not really making an error, right? Because they're getting really good odds. I mean, unless they're just limping absolute trash. I mean, they could be limping absolute trash, but no reason to think they're limping absolute trash. So you probably you don't want to go tiny in that spot because your opponent's not making a mistake. You make money when your opponents mess up, not when they play well. All right, ace five offsuit facing a raise from under the gun. Um, this is a hand that you should call, but if you had a much of a weak raise, like ace three or ace two, it's probably a fold. We could probably three bet bluff this forty big blinds deep some portion of the time. Again, reference the poker coach and charts. You will see ace five offsuit. I think I think three bet bluffs a little bit in this spot. So calling is fine. Oh, I remember this player. This player is loose, aggressive European guy. Definitely worth noting. Um, when your opponent's loose and aggressive, then you should be way less inclined to overfold. If the under the gun player was like really tight, aggressive though, you definitely should just fold the ace five in this spot. Even closing the action, even in the big blind, even getting good odds, doesn't matter. You're gonna be so dominated. But not against this player. All right, bottom pair. We check, opponent bets 5K. If you bet smaller, you may wanna put in a raise, but you don't wanna be doing a ton of raising in general against the under the gun razor because they just have a whole lot of strong hands here. Um, and also when the opponent uses a slightly bigger bet size than a small bet size, you should be also less inclined to check raise. So I think we're going to start losing some of these bottom pair check raises in the spot. We'll just call. Turns an ace of hearts. Funny enough, I check here, but I think leading is actually viable. You may say, why in the world is leading viable? You, well, if you've studied the book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games, there's a chapter in it that discusses times to lead. And one of the main times to lead are when the board brings a three flush and, very importantly, the ace and the king are on the board. If you think about the under the gun raising range, under the gun raising range contains a lot of ace x suited, a lot of king x suited, and not a whole lot of other suited hands. They have queen jack, queen 10, maybe queen nine, jack 10, maybe jack nine, 10 nine, that's about it. It's only six combinations of hands. Maybe they have seven, six. Maybe they have six, five. They do not have a whole lot of flushes here, right? But if you think about the big blind defending range, I actually have a ton of flushes because I'm defending a lot of um, the suited hands. A, a lot of you are saying, don't you want to lead so it doesn't check through? Again, this is you're thinking way too simplistically here. You always want to be thinking, what does my, what do the various portions of my range want to do? And you're betting because you have an equity advantage, typically. That's that's why you want to be betting. Um, and in the spot, we have a big equity. And we start to have an equity advantage with my range because we have a lot of flushes and the opponent doesn't, which allows us to bet with some thin-ish value hands because I certainly don't want it to check through here. And also, um, maybe just probably have the best hand, right? So I think, I think leading is reasonable. Now, the times I would definitely not lead or when I think the opponent's very inclined to over bluff and this loose aggressive European player if anything like like this is the kind of guy I really want to check to because this player is not going to check through they instead are going to uh just keep betting with all potential bluffs like what what are what are logical bluffs here well any hand with a queen jack or ten of hearts is pretty logical and they may open it up with a jack ten offsuit under the gun for all I know I don't think they do well but they may what are other logical bluffs well, maybe stuff like bottom pair or middle pair may decide to bluff, although maybe not. I also think if the opponent is good and loose aggressive and they've studied GTO poker, then they will also bluff with small pairs with a heart. If you study our tournament masterclass, you know that comes up some portion of the time. So I definitely want to check to this player. Won't Ace King just call if you lead with a bluffing hand? Well, I mean, look, if, I, if I'm betting the turn, I'm jamming the river because I have the best hand the vast majority of the time. You can't be worried about losing in this spot. Will we lead with ace, seven of diamonds? I mean, against this player, like I said, I'm just not leading all that often at all. Someone's doing work in my apartment right now. And uh, that's what the drilling is, if you can hear that. Go figure. Perfect timing, right? Uh, and again, I think a lot of you in the chat are very concerned with the idea that you could be beat here. And yeah, you could be beat here, but you have to realize my range is in great shape and the opponent's not going to go around folding ace, queen, or ace, jack. And if they do, they're they're probably just going to be drastically overfolding. But anyway, this is the spot where I'm going to check against this guy. 
just because this guy is going to be inclined to over bluff. He bets turn. Do I want to raise? Probably not. Seems like a pretty bad spot to raise. So if I raise, now what, I'm gonna, what am I going to get action from? Well, flushes, which I lose to. Sets, which I lose to. Two pair, which I lose to. And maybe like ace, queen of hearts. Ace, I'm sorry, ace, queen with the queen of hearts or ace, jack with the jack of hearts. That's about it. So I definitely do not want to raise in this scenario. Definitely want to call and keep my opponent in with all their bluffs. And I mean, there's some world where say they have ace, king, the river brings another heart. I don't lose, right? Because they'll just check, check. So this is a great spot just to call and give them every chance to bluff the river. River's a pretty sweet card. I check. Opponent rips it in. 1.5x pot. How do you feel about this one? I will say in most small and medium stakes games, when people take this line of blast flop, flop, blast turn, bet flop, bet turn, and then over jam river, they almost always have a very good hand. In the high stakes games, though, I can guarantee you this guy's going to show up with some bluffs, like just random queen of hearts, random jack of hearts, random ten of hearts, pocket fours with a four of hearts. Um... And there are plenty of bluffing hands in this scenario, right? I don't think the opponent's going to overvalue a hand like Ace with the Queen of Hearts. That seems optimistic. But this is a pretty, pretty reasonable call. So I call. Shows me the pocket threes with the three of hearts. Aggressive line. I would not expect most small and medium stakes players to take this line. I think a lot of small and medium stakes players just bet flop and then give up. Jake Fleming says, are you ready to go home, though? That does not matter. The fact that, I, like, you got to get all these thoughts out of your mind. If you're thinking at the table, oh, man, I should fold because I don't want to leave. You're going to have a tough time winning at poker, honestly, because you have to think, how do I fare against my opponent's range in this scenario? And if this guy is over bluffing, if anything, you cannot go around over folding. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So this is a spot where you just have to find a call. Some of you saying in the chat, this guy's bluff is ridiculous. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, from a GTO point of view, this should get bluffed off some portion of the time. These small pairs with a flush blocker, a baby flush blocker, turns out these are reasonable bluffing hands. Because if you think about your range, you don't have all that many very, very logical bluffs. Because it's not like you're opening queen of hearts, nine of spades under the gun, right? So this is a situation where the opponent has to look kind of hard for bluffs and when, when you're looking kind of hard for bluffs, this is the type of hand that usually does go for the bluff. If it was a lag player, would you call? This was a loose aggressive player. I already said this was a loose aggressive player. They could have a flush. Well, any, of course you could have a flush. Pot odds, right? Pocket kings. We open it up. Under the gun. Three players. Call me. Queen, eight, three. I think this is a spot where we want to bet with our best value hands that are vulnerable to being outdrawn and some draws. Draws here are going to be stuff like 10-9 suited. Maybe hands like ace, four of clubs. And then we want to be betting stuff like kings, ace, queen, king, queen, probably. Something like that seems reasonable. So I think we can bet. Usually when you want to bet in multi-way spots, you typically want to go for a small size. So we do go 5K. Some players say, or some of you in the chat saying you want to bet big. Um, look, if you study GTO strategies in multi-way spots, when you're betting out of position, you pretty much always want to be betting small. When you bet in general in multi-way pots, you want to be betting small. Exploitatively, I actually don't hate the idea of betting bigger. Because if you think your opponents are just literally never folding a pair and literally never folding a draw or a backdoor draw, then... Sure, right? But good players realize hands like an eight or a three are not great in this scenario. And if I am raising under the gun and betting into all the opponents, I got to have something good unless I'm just trying to get my money away. So anyone who's good is going to realize they should be drastically overfolding in this scenario. And when you bet bigger and bigger, they're going to make bigger and bigger folds. Now, but, but again, if your opponent's just calling stations because they think eight, seven is the nuts here, then maybe it does make sense to bet bigger. Cutoff calls. Turns a jack of clubs. If you all enjoy this show, by the way, click the like button, click the subscribe button. Turn is jack of clubs. Pretty bad card, right? The bad cards on the turn were an ace, a queen, a jack, a 10, a nine, or an eight. Those were all especially bad. 
Every other card is fine. Um, I think we have a pretty easy check now. We have relatively few 10-9 suiteds in our range. The opponent certainly could have them in their range, but also we don't have a whole lot of queen jacks, right? This is a spot where I'm probably not opening queen jack under the gun, although I may. Ugh, I don't know. If I have queen jack in my range, we can probably justify betting here. If I don't have queen jack in my range, we, we definitely want to check. And I, I say I don't have queen jack because I may not even open it pre-flop, but also I would probably not bet queen jack on the flop. And that may surprise some people, but you have to realize that in this scenario, if you bet queen jack on the flop and the turn and the river and get called, you probably lose unless you make two pair. You want a marginal ace to call preflop? What are you talking about? I'm not sure what you were talking about. I did not even talk about marginal ace x preflop. All right. So we're going to check the turn here. If the opponent bets, we will definitely just call. Check, check, though. Rivers of two of spades. Take a second. Think about it. What should we do in this scenario? Well, what does the opponent likely have? The opponent likely has, in my mind, a queen or a jack. You may say, wouldn't they always bet the turn with a queen? And I think not if the opponent's good. If the opponent has a hand like queen 10 or queen 9 suited, then they are very likely to check it back on the turn because they really don't want to bet and then get raised, right? The opponent also would float the flop with jack 10 and jack 9, and they would almost certainly check those on the turn. They could also have a hand like an 8, and 8's probably going to fold to any reasonable bet I have to presume. So I think we have two options depending on the opponent's strategy. Either we could check, and then when the opponent bets, put in a check, raise, all in. I know that may sound insane, may sound a little loose and aggressive, but in this spot, I almost always have the best hand when the river brings a 2, because the 2 is just a stone brick, right? And notice if the opponent did have 10-9 or clean jack or jack-8, they would almost always bet the turn. If they had a set, they'd almost always bet the turn. So you can very, very much remove better hands from my opponent's range than pocket kings. And the nice thing about this spot is if the opponent does have a queen or maybe even a jack, they're going to go for value. So I definitely love the idea of putting in a check raise here, especially if the opponent is loose and aggressive and they'll value bet then and maybe they'll even hero call it off a little bit then. Something a lot of people not, do not do nearly often enough is put in a check raise on the river. The other option is to bet big. If you bet big in this spot, the opponent's definitely going to call the queen and they'll probably call the jack, given there are plenty of busted draws I could have, like um, ace X suited, right? Ace four suited, like I mentioned, I'd probably bet on the flop and probably give up on the turn and be sitting here with random ace four of hearts and feel inclined to bluff it. So this is a pretty good spot to either check or bet big. Some people saying they want to half pot it. I hate the idea of half potting. Like, what are you trying to get called by when you half pot? Like, 8-7? I mean, 8-7 may call, but probably not. Pocket 7s may decide to call, but probably not. So I think if you're trying to get called by random hands like 8-7, you probably want to go smaller. But even then, kings are not a hand that wants to go small in the spot because kings are almost always going to be the nuts here, right? Because of what I just said. And whenever the opponent does not bet the turn and then the river brings a total brick too, we basically have the nuts. And the nuts usually wants to go big. We talked about this with the king five suited earlier. Same spot here. Nuts usually want to go big. Or check. We do go big. Opponent calls. We win. And they show me a queen. That's a bummer. It's a bummer because if I checked, they would have bet. And then we could have gotten in the check raise. Um, as you think your opponent has fewer and fewer queens in their range, you should be more inclined to bet river. But in this spot, there's no reason I think they have like squarely a queen. I also usually like betting big in high roller tournaments in general because the players are a little bit more call happy on the river, especially when random draws miss. And there are plenty of draws that or just jar, junk hands that I could have that could feel inclined to bluff. So I'm fine with that one. Pocket aces. Under the gun raises. Under the gun is a loose, aggressive, splashy player who I've already seen raise and then call a three bet with the queen four suited. So what should we do with the aces? Playing 53 big blinds deep. I think we have two options. The obvious option is to re-raise. 
GTO strategy is to re-raise. If the opponent's going to call three bets with the queen four suited, we should definitely re-raise. So that's a good reason to re-raise. But you see the reason to call. There's a very clear reason to call here, too. Well, take a look at the two players yet to act on the button and the small blind. The button and the small blind both have almost no chips. Very, 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 very good shoving stacks, right? And if they think under the gun is raising with stuff like queen four suited, and they think I'm going to obviously widen my calling range to try to play pots with this loose aggressive splashy player, this is a great spot to flat call to try to induce slightly wide shoves from the small blind or the big blind. So I, I love calling in this spot, although, look, I, I totally get that three betting is fine as well. If you can somehow look and tell the player in the button and the small blind are interested in the hand, definitely call. If you can somehow look and tell they're done with the hand, definitely three bet. We call. It does not work. Flop comes, eight, five, four. Opponent bets 11,000. I usually say to not get fancy with aces, just raise it. I mean, I usually say follow the GTO charts, but it's always important to realize GTO charts not necessarily apply unless you have a very, 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 very specific GTO chart, right? And um, in this scenario, I don't have charts for 15 and 20 big blind stacks remaining behind, but I bet calling aces isn't all that bad. Maybe men re-raise to get the small blind to shove? No, you got to realize if under the gun raises and you re-raise small pre-flop, small blind and button are never shoving, ever, unless they have a good hand, because it's so obvious you're calling their shove. If you put in five big blinds, you're not folding for 10 more, which will make it to where they must have a good hand to shove, whereas when you call, they can shove substantially wider. All right, you all are all over the place on this flop scenario of eight, five, four. I think it's a pretty reasonable spot to raise given the opponent's range is very wide and they're gonna have a lot of random pairs like queen four suited or like a random seven or a random six. Um, also, if the opponent does have an over pair, it's really nice to raise now before the board potentially gets worse. Now, I realize they're super loose pre-flop, but obviously they could still have a hand like pocket tens, right? The problem with calling is that the turn's going to be rough some portion of the time to the point that either my hand gets way worse, although I already know I'm not folding, <laughs> or to where the opponent's made hands get a lot worse. Like, say the guy does have queen four suited. He may just, like, not fold it to a flop raise. But say the turn's a jack, and then he bets, and then I raise then, he's going to fold queen four suited every time. So I think we want to raise, and I don't think we want to go too big. Josh says go 40k. The problem with 40k is it doesn't give the opponent any room to bluff shove me, really. Can you apply all this to online? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, online and live poker are the exact same thing. The only difference is the ranges online are usually better than the ranges live because online players typically play, play better than live players, right? Also, you usually have fewer reads online compared to live. So anyway, right here, I think we just want to raise... It's definitely annoying when you raise and the opponent folds, but this type of loose, aggressive, splashy, battling player is the type of player who will not fold all that often. Definitely do not jam all in, by the way. Some people saying rip it all in. I hate ripping it all in because then your opponent can never bluff. You want to keep the opponent in the pot with bluffs. It's vitally important. Everybody here worried about getting full value and protecting your range or thinking about the wrong things. The main, value, the main point here is you got to keep your opponent in with all their garbage. That is what we are trying to accomplish. Anyway, we go for 27K. I think this is fine and reasonable. Again, you don't want to go too big because if you go too big, your opponent cannot float with all sorts of garbage and they cannot re-raise with all sorts of garbage. Then the opponent makes it 63 with 90 behind. Hmm, <laughs> How do you feel about this? This is a weird one at this point. I do not expect to get re-raised very often at all because... I mean, but when I raise, I'm either saying I have some total garbage or I have a super nut hand, right? Or I have some high equity draw. But I'm probably not raising the high equity draws because I don't want to get re-raised, right? Uh, so I think it's a spot where shoving's the, the logical play. Just because if he folds out any hand with equity, I don't care. And if he does have a hand like A7, I don't care if he folds, right? Said if, if I know he has a seven, I want to keep him in. The thing is, is like this might be the type of player who just takes a hand like Jack Ten of Hearts and decides to blast it. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Definitely a rough spot. I mean, it's a rough spot in that I don't know if I'm supposed to presume the opponent's range is so garbage 
that I'm supposed to call, or if I'm supposed to just presume the guy has an overpair, or top pair, or a draw or something, and he wants to get it in. And again, people saying that this board does not connect with his range. You must have missed it five seconds ago. Where I said the guy raises queen four suited and calls three bets with it and whatnot. So this is the type of player who could definitely have random one pair hand here. But anyway, I don't know if it's a call or a shove. I can be convinced either way. I kind of presumed that once the opponent puts in 63K with only 90 behind, he just has a hand he's putting in. So I shove. He snap folded. That's a bummer. That's a big bummer. It's a big bummer because he probably just had no equity. When he has no equity, I obviously want to keep him in the pot. So that's a bummer. All right, ace and king. 14 big blind all in from the low jack seat. We're on the button. What do we do with our ace king offsuit? Take a second, think about it. Again, all these people in the chat saying that he has a good draw, he has a top pair, he has a set. You don't know. What do you mean? How, how could you possibly predict a random player on the internet in a hand history play based on my second hand speaking? How do you know? To the point that you're willing to type it into the chat box that this player has a drawer, this player has a setter, this player has whatever. You don't know. People have ranges. People have ranges. Not specific hands. They have ranges. All right. Basing a 42K raise. We only have one option in my opinion. If you've read my books at all, if you study pokercoaching.com at all, you know the answer. It is to call. Whenever someone shoves all in, if you have... Well, if the shove is six big blinds or fewer, you usually want to re-raise the minimum. If it's six big blinds or more, you usually want to call. A lot of people are thinking, oh, I want to shove because I want the players yet to act to fold. But what do you want them to fold? Ace, Jack? Like you want them in with Ace, Jack, right? So this is a spot where I don't know exactly what your calling range should be, but it should probably be something like sevens and better and like Ace, 10 suited and better, Ace, Jack off suited and better. Maybe king, queen suited. I think that's a pretty reasonable calling range. And then if you get shoved on by someone and you have to act for 240K, then we'll call it off with Jackson better and ace king, maybe ace queen suited. And that's a very nice strategy. What a lot of people do wrong is that they shove the hands that they want their opponent, when they want their opponents to fold, and they call with the hands that are just the super duper nuts. But if you start doing that and anybody is halfway aware of what you're doing, you're just going to get crushed because they're not going to put in their money when you just call. And detrimentally, they're going to call it off a little bit wider when you do shove, which is really, really bad for you. So this is a spot where this is 14 big blinds. This is just a very, very, very easy call. We call. He has pocket eights. We lose. Nothing to see there. Ace king again. I raise it up, get called by the hijack. Hijack is a loose, well, you know, hijack is not necessarily loose. Hijack is a young European player who I think plays well. I, I don't know a ton about the player, but he gets in there, he battles, he he plays pots. <coughs> All right, flop comes, 5-3-2. What should we do with ace-king on the 5-3-2? Why not men re-raise? Because if I men re-raise with a hand like sevens and they get jammed on, I lose more money. Again, we're playing our range, not our hand. We're playing all hands we could have in this scenario. Now, you could split the range if you wanted, but I don't think there's a reason to split it. Um, okay, ace-king on five through two. This is a board I'm going to check a ton. I, from out of position against the hijack, you want to be checking a lot in this scenario. If you studied the tournament master class at pokercoaching.com, you know that you do a ton of checking here. So we check. Bona bets 10K. I think this is a spot where the opponent's supposed to have a lot of small bets. And when they bet half pot, you have to ask, can I get any information from this? I think generally when people bet this size in this scenario, it's probably closer to, to being a lot of pairs that are just trying to get value slash protection. Although, you know, loose, aggressive, battling opponent. Not insane, not like an insane player, but, you know, pretty active player. They could easily just be betting stuff like Queen Jack and whatnot. Um... So I think this is a spot where we should probably... I mean, look, we're not folding here. Um, the question is either do we want to call or do we want to raise. And I don't think we need to raise this one either because the opponent may just be betting lots of stuff planning to check it down. So we're going to call. Doesn't checking polarize you? 
No, I'm going to be checking the vast majority of my range here. When people saying shove it all in. Definitely don't shove it all in. When you get called, you're going to be in terrible shape. Turn to three. Check. Opponent bets. 25k. Rough spot for sure. I ran this through a GTO solver. You know what it says you should do here at the Ace King? Specifically diamonds and hearts. It said you should call half the time and fold half the time. Now, if I think the opponent's a little bit loose and aggressive, I'm going to be way more inclined to call. If I think the opponent is um, on the more cautious side, I'm definitely going to fold. If I am playing a tournament, if anything, I should be way more inclined to fold because I don't want to put myself in a spot to play a pretty big pot going to the river with a marginal bluff catcher. Ideally, you want to avoid very roughly break-even scenarios. So... This is a spot where I think you can definitely go either way. Knowing me, I lean towards calling here. <laughs> I don't do a whole lot of folding when I'm getting okay pot odds with a pretty good hand. Because you got to realize, there, there's no guarantee the opponent's just going to blast it off on every river. And also, there are plenty of good rivers for me, right? Ace, King, Four are all great. So, we stick around. Well, I, I love how the people in the chat, some people are in the chat are saying, like, easy fold or easy call. you got to realize, if you think this is an easy fold against a good player, you're screwing up. If you think this is an easy call against a good player, you're screwing up. By saying it's an easy call or an easy fold in my mind, I think you mean I call here 100% or I fold here 100%, which would be very, very wrong. I mean, look at the GTO solver, run it. I think if anything, the player's over bluffing, which should lead me to call more, right? But this is a situation where literally it's like 50% call, 50% fold, which means it doesn't really matter what you do. Rivers of three, I check. Opponent goes kind of big, 60K. Definitely an annoying spot as well. Uh, the only way you can justify calling here is if you are very sure the opponent will over bluff, right? Now, it's pretty easy to over bluff here if you think about it. I don't block the ace X of hearts. I don't block queen X of hearts, jack X of hearts, 10 X of hearts. The opponent could certainly have all those. I also don't block just random, uh, random draws, ra random nonsense stuff like queen jack, right? They would, they would definitely like queen jack of spades, probably going to bet the flop, probably going to bet the turn, may or may not bet the river. It depends. By the way, it's important to note that this is a spot where we need to be very sure we have our range protected. Otherwise, like say this is one of the best hands in our range, like apparently some of you think you would do, where you bet your over pairs, but check your ace high. Well, then you definitely have to call, right? Because this is one of the best hands we can have. But I know I'm checking a lot of over pairs here. So I know my range can be decently protected, and when your range is decently protected, you just start folding out a lot of these ace X's, right? Ace two of hearts would be painful. <laughs> Why do we keep calling when we're most likely beat? Why do you think we're most likely beat? Whenever you say you think the opponent is we're most likely beat, you're saying the opponent has literally no bluffs in their range. If they have no bluffs in their range, then fold. Come on, like poker is easy if you know what your opponents are doing. But remember, we're playing a high six tournament against good players. You give this guy queen jack of spades, I think he's going to be bluffing some portion of the time, especially if he thinks I have a whole lot of ace-x, which means I should be more inclined to call. Now, in this scenario, uh, if you run this to a GTO solver, ace-king is mostly a fold, which means if you think the opponent's playing perfectly, then uh, it's a spot where uh, we, we have a, probably a fold. Why would this be one of the best hands we have? Well, a lot of you said on the flop in the chat that you would bet your over pairs and check your ace-high. If you're going to bet your over pairs and check your ace high, this is essentially the best hand we can possibly have, right? So if this is the best hand we can possibly have, we cannot fold it. Now, obviously, that's not this scenario that we are in here because I would be betting with, I'd be checking with a lot of over pairs as well because, like I said, I check a lot on the flop here. But that's why it's important to protect your range. Otherwise, if this is the best hand you can have, you're just super easy to play against. So anyway, what do I do here? I think I called. You know me, I call a lot. Pocket tens, we lose. There's obviously a value bet on the turn. Wow, Sneakies thinks that the opponent is awful at poker. Why do you all think that people in $25,000 tournaments who fly halfway across the world are so bad at poker? I don't understand. It makes no sense. You gotta understand, whenever you say things like, my opponent's never bluffing here, or you say things like, that's obviously a bluff. When you say things like this, you're saying my opponent is so terrible 
that they are incompetent enough to the point that they have no bluffs and or no value bets in a particular spot. And you know, maybe that's true against some of your opponents. And if you are, congrats, because you're going to win all their money. You're going to win all their money and poker's easy. But I hate to break it to you. In high stakes games, poker's not easy. All right, ace-king. Very next hand. I actually got these ace, these three ace-kings three hands in a row. Ace-king, ace-king, ace-king. Three hands in a row. Lost the first one, lost the second one. What do you think's happened on the third one? I raise it up. Uh, button calls. Button, good, loose-ish, aggressive-ish kid. Flop comes ace-king, five. Two options. Is the opponent able to bet three streets with ace-high that you beat? The opponent's probably going to be bluffing ace-high. They're going to be bluffing king-high, queen-high, jack-high, ten-high. Um, so this ace-king. Again, this was literally the next hand. Maybe, maybe two hands apart. Really, really back to back. So the opponent just said, or I mean, we, we the opponent just saw me call down with a, a hand worse than 10. So obviously some sort of bluff catcher, right? They probably presume pair, but maybe bluff catcher. So they saw me check out of position with a bluff catcher and check call. Does that matter? Does it matter what just happened in the very recent past? I think no. Some people think it does. Some people do not. There are some players who are way more levelly and trying to figure out what you're doing than others. Um, a lot of people just try to play close to GTO. I'm not sure what this particular player thinks, but in most high stakes games, I do not care at all about what just happened recently. But against some players, I certainly will. Um, so in this spot, we have two options: either check, call, uh, bet, bet the flop, and bet turn, jump, shove river. Or just put in check raise immediately. I think either play is definitely fine and definitely viable. I decided to check. Opponent bet 8K. And I called. I do not like this call. In order to call here, I have to think the opponent's range is either pretty garbage or I have to think they are going to attempt to drastically overbluff and or value bet thinly. Or I have to think that the opponent's going to overfold to a check raise. I know who this player is, and I think they probably actually would overfold to a check raise, which means I probably shouldn't have checked to begin with. I probably should have just bet flop. If I do bet flop, by the way, I probably want to go medium size so I can easily get it in by the river. You don't want to go too small, I don't think. So, you know, I don't mind this spot. I, I think check call is fine if you think the opponent's going to overfold. I'm not all that worried about getting outdrawn. Um, obviously, flush draws exist, but at the same time, so do all sorts of other hands that, that are... Drawn very, very thin. So I don't know. We can go either way, but I, I, I should have just bet the flop here. I think bet flop is very standard. If I did check raise, it'd probably be to something like 23K. Crypto dad life. 21, 23, whatever. You have to realize in this spot, the opponent's range connectivity is very good, right? So as the opponent's more likely to have just a decently good hand that's not going to fold, you'd rather just put in more money. When the opponent's range is either going to be like really good hands or absolute trash, in those scenarios, you probably just want, want to go for the smaller check raise. But here, it's really easy for the opponent to have a pair or a draw, right? And if they have a pair or a draw, a lot of the time in the spot, you probably want to go slightly bigger. Also, from out of position, you usually want to go slightly bigger. Not always, but sometimes. All right, turns to Queen of Diamonds. Pretty bad card, of course. I check. Opponent bets 32 with 43 behind only. Annoying spot. Um, obviously, I'm not folding, though. This is a hand that is way too good. Only question is, should I call or jam? And if you think about the player's logical bluffs, what would they even be? They would be hands like 10 of hearts, 10 of diamonds, or 10 of diamonds, 10 of X, right? That's a logical bluff. Maybe hands like nines, eights, sevens. Those hands are all drawing pretty thin, but at the same time, they may not feel inclined to bluff the river. So definitely a rough scenario because I don't think a lot of their logical bluffs are going to keep bluffing on the river. So if they're not going to keep bluffing the river with lots of logical bluffs, we probably just want to get it in now to protect the equity. Also notice that in this scenario, if we do shove, the opponent's going to be getting really good pot odds. They're going to have to put in 30 to win, what, 200? Or no, what? Uh, how much is it? Yeah, 30 to win 200. So like they're going to call it off with all their stuff, right? So I think we just want to call it. We just want to rip it in. I think that's the only play that makes any sense. We shove. They call. Eight, seven of diamonds, and we have been vanquished.
That's why GTO is no good. You just have to be able to look them in the eye and tell if they have a good hand. You know, if only poker was as easy as just looking at someone and winning all of their money. Unfortunately, it is not that easy. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. It's tens and nines betting the flop that often. Some players will. Some players won't. I don't, I don't hate it. I mean, I think it's probably okay. But, um, yeah, we lost. Sometimes you win. Sometimes you lose. And that's how it goes. Someone who's not losing recently is our newest poker coach and coach, Brock Wilson. If you've been paying attention to the poker news. Literally yesterday, he took third place in a very big tournament for $411,000. Huge congrats to him. And right now, we are having a Labor Day sale at PokerCoaching.com. And we have brand new training exclusively from Brock Wilson, who is out there crushing the games. Current videos up at this point include an introduction to Pio Solver reviews and discussing very, very common spots for in-position versus big blind, how you should be playing those scenarios and thinking about those spots. I know a lot of the spots we went through today were apparently somewhat unknown to some of you all, and he goes through a lot of those spots. He also goes through button versus cutoff strategy. A lot of players make blunders all over the place playing cutoff versus button. When you raise the cutoff and the button calls, because they usually continuation bet too often, they don't check raise enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He also discusses defense frequencies and why they are important. I'll give you the spoiler. If you fold too much, you can't win at poker. If you consistently give your equity away to your opponents, they're going to win and you're going to lose. And also, how to adjust your strategy and how to analyze your strategy using GTO solvers when you have some idea of how your opponents play. If you know that your opponent, let's say, does not three bet often enough, or if you know that they, let's say, don't continuation bet the flop often enough, or maybe they continuation bet the flop every time, you can use the GTO solver to give you the strategy against the mistakes that your opponents are making. And in a lot of small stakes games, you very often know mistakes your opponents are making. For example, a lot of you in the chat seem to think that your opponents do not bluff the river nearly often enough. Fine, put it in the solver. Let the solver know that my opponents do not bluff the river often enough, and you're going to see that you should drastically overfold on that street, wherever that is. If your opponents drastically overbluff, you're not going to fold very often at all. Kind of like that ace-king hand. I probably leveled myself into thinking the opponent may be overbluffing. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it was good. Maybe it was a good call. Maybe it was terrible. That's the tough thing about poker. But um, anyway, Brock is the GTO wizard. He has been crushing poker recently, and I'm very, very happy to have these videos and a whole lot more being added to PokerCoaching.com very, very soon. You can actually get your first month of Poker Coaching Premium that gives you access to everything we have on the site, which is a ton of content, many thousands of hours, but also organized in a way that is very easy for you to get in and start learning poker immediately, especially through my tournament and cash game masterclasses. Um, you can get in there for just 49 bucks for your first month. If you have any desire to improve your poker skills, you need to find a structured way to learn because that's going to get you way better at poker than just playing and trying to figure it out. So many players think that if they get a lot of experience, they will just naturally become winners. But I hate to break it to you. If you play poorly over and over and over again, it's not going to help you. Instead, learn from players who are crushing the games. And I make a point to hire lots and lots of coaches who are absolutely crushing the games at all stakes. You see our coaches are a little bit blurred out here. You can go read about all the coaches at pokercoaching.com. And you can get into the Labor Day sale right now at pokercoaching.com slash Labor Day. That's going to get for today. I hope you enjoyed this show. If you do, if you did, do me a quick favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons down below. Um, I actually have four webinars, I think, coming up very, very soon for poker coaching members. That's going to be a lot of fun. We have a poker coaching homework webinar. We, we have a homework question every month. That, I think, happens on Monday. So there's a lot happening at PokerCoaching.com right now. So make sure you get in there and study. Andrew says, the tournament masterclasses and the webinars with Matt Affleck are excellent. Yeah, Matt Affleck is a workhorse. He studies a ton, plays a ton, and works hard. And he has um, webinars every week where essentially he just sits down and he studies a lot. And he studies with the poker coaching members. So you all essentially get to guide these study sessions 
and you get to help him determine what he's going to be reviewing. And then he goes through those spots and makes sure that you all know how to play those spots well. So anyway, check it out. Jewelry says you signed up last month and you're loving it. Good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Glad you all are enjoying it. So anyway, check it out. PokerCoaching.com slash Labor Day. If you have any questions about this sale, feel free to send us an email at support at PokerCoaching.com and we will answer those or just head over to PokerCoaching.com slash Labor Day and the information will be there too. Thank you for being here. I appreciate all of you. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. I hope you have a great weekend. Talk to you next time.